Okay. Well, thank you, Sally. Thank you all for having me today. Okay, very good. So thanks again for having me. Uh, so my name is De Quinzio. Take it slow, let it come out easily. Um, it's Italian. It means of the fifth or pertaining to the fifth, but we don't know the fifth what. You know, fifth night in jail, we, we don't know. So uh, I'm going to be talking about electric propulsion, where we're going, where we've been. Um, but as Sally mentioned, uh, my day job, if you will, uh, that I took uh, the afternoon off from is in the data center industry, not the computers, uh, but the power and the air conditioning. Uh, and so, uh, so rather than stand in front of the screen here, I'll move off to the side. Uh, so uh, what that means is rooms full of batteries, um, lineups of switch gear uh, that are as long as this room in some cases. And uh, uh, it's a field that I just kind of stumbled into by dumb luck, but uh, lots of engineers spend most of their career, uh, well, we used to say at the drafting board, now we say at the CAD station, uh, but my career was not like that. Um, I didn't want to be cooped up in an office, so I do more of the field work, testing, commissioning, failure analysis, things of that nature, training, uh, some of those things. Uh, also, um, grew up in the Philly area, went to the Jersey Shore as a kid, uh, started sailing on sunfish with my brother. Uh, and so, um, so we're going to cover today some introduction that we're doing now, talk a little bit about history. It has um, been something of a surprise, the, uh, the extent to which uh, electric propulsion is somewhat of an old idea. Uh, then we'll talk about what it offers, um, particularly for the recreational uh, boater, uh, and then what are some obstacles that we're experiencing uh, and how we deal with them. Uh, and then we'll talk about improvements and then what it means to all of you as marine surveyors. So had you been around in 1893 and gone to the World Expo in Chicago, you could have ridden uh, around in the lake there on an Elko motor yacht. Uh, they, were, uh, they were taking uh, visitors around to the various exhibits. Uh, and Elko is still in business today. Uh, well then, uh, these two guys. You know who these guys are? Rockefeller and Flagler, Standard Oil, that whole bit. Um, they won. Uh, and um, uh, what, what, I mean, what I mean by that is the, the internal combustion engine that fueled by gasoline won the day um, partly because of range, right? And that's still something we talk about today with electric vehicles. So electric faded from the scene, uh, but the the comeback uh, for electric as an option uh, actually began in the 70s. Um, and the gentleman in the photo on the right is Morton Ray uh, with one of his outboards. The third one he built is still running. Uh, is uh, quite a reliable piece of equipment. And now, uh, in addition to Mr. Ray, others have, uh, have stepped up uh, and begun offering uh, new uh, options, mostly because of advances in other fields. Uh, motor control, for example, used to be very clunky, difficult, unreliable, uh, lots of moving pieces. Now we buy bricks about this big with a couple of terminals on them and they do everything. Uh, and uh, some, of the, some of the players that came along after Mr. Ray have since fallen by the wayside, but uh, in uh, now in uh, in 2018, uh, we have a stable pool of suppliers that we can work with, uh, and we have better analytics to uh, know how to match boats with systems and boat owners with systems, and that's a really important part. Um, so that's me in our uh, Martini 21 uh, motor launch that we have in Annapolis. We use that as a demonstrator vessel. Uh, and uh, with a five kilowatt system, it'll do uh, about six knots uh, for about 40 minutes, but we don't have a very large battery uh, installed in it. So if you happen to be in Annapolis and the weather's decent, uh, then uh, let us know. We'll take you for a spin on Energetic. That's the name of the boat. So why, are, why is it that we are able uh, to offer electric propulsion and uh, have some people say, yes, that's what I want. 
Uh, well, in our case, as Sally mentioned, we went cruising in our uh, Moody 37, uh, 96, 97, and we, we pulled our son out of school and homeschooled him for his sixth grade year. And, uh, and it was a, a trip of a lifetime, of course, uh, but the diesel, uh, the diesel almost ruined the whole thing for us. Uh, and um, uh, everything from raw water problems, uh, but also uh, inadequate charging of our house battery system and, and things of that nature. So that's where I got to thinking, uh, maybe, maybe this isn't the best way. Um, so uh, we began this whole journey and um, in the next few slides, I'm gonna walk you through, well, what, what have we learned? Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk only about displacement vessels. Um, there, it is possible to plane with electric, but that's another discussion. Uh, it's expensive, but it's doable. So, um, so generally, if we wanna get a boat moving, we've gotta get a jet of water moving aft from a boat. Okay, you guys already know that. Um, how do you move water? You feed a prop torque. Um, that's me on the right, by the way. <laughs> uh, so as props, you know, some of these slides I use for less knowledgeable folks than yourself, so bear with me a sec. Uh, but as you know, you want to push more water, add blades, make the blades bigger, increase diameter, uh, and spin them faster. But regardless, you, anything can turn a prop, right? You can even hook up a bunch of hamsters and wheels. You have to feed them and clean up after them and you need a lot of them. Um, but then uh, let's move into boats. As you already know, long water line, uh, less weights and spread over that long water line, uh, less beam, et cetera, uh, will take less in terms of torque that has to be applied to a prop to move that boat. Whereas a shorter, wider, heavier boat is going to need more. But let's drill in and think a little bit more, more deeply about how prop works and what a prop really wants. So we're, we're gonna talk about a boat that's gonna go six knots. But right now we're only talking about from dead stop to one knot. What do we have to do? Well, um, we have to get that prop moving to establish that jet of water that, that's just sitting there standing still, right? So we don't need a lot of RPM, but we do need a lot of torque up front. Hold that thought. Now we're gonna look at the other end. Once we're up to five knots, we're gonna go six. What do we need to do now? Well, we've already got a good jet of water moving after the boat, we just need to accelerate it. And to do that, we don't need much more torque, but we need, we need a big change in RPM. Hold that thought. So what do props want? They want, they want high torque at low RPM, they need less torque at, uh, at low speed. They need high torque at low speed. They need less torque at high speeds. What does an electric motor offer versus what a diesel offers? Well, what's a diesel engine or any internal combustion engine? It's a hunk of metal in which explosions are happening. How do you get more torque out of that combustion engine? You need a higher number of explosions in the same amount of time. Well, that only happens at the higher RPMs. Whereas an electric motor, as soon as you apply power, you magnetize its windings, it, energy transfer starts to happen and it starts spinning. So I got a little ahead of myself here, but the, the point I'm making is that in order to deal with that torque mismatch, uh, recreational boaters have become accustomed to having and, and boat builders are accustomed to providing what are in, a, in essence oversized diesel engines. Uh, and so, um, and, and these are engines that when you rev them up to say 1800 RPM or so, they don't do all that much. It's only when you push harder, uh, and generally true in sailboats and, and some other boats as well. But um, the, the point being is that <clears throat> for, with, with a much smaller electric motor, we can deliver the same speed. And people have been, um, uh, have been surprised to hear that. Uh, and they have, uh, some have argued with us um, and didn't believe it until we took them out on the demo boat and then they, then they understood. Um, so um, this is one thing where my experience in the data center industry helps 
uh, because we, we have lots of diesel engines. Uh, in, in some cases, uh, if there's a blackout, but you still have internet service or something like that, uh, that's because a large number of diesel engines have automatically started and begun uh, taking over the load. Uh, but um, for years, uh, we've been trying to make sure that those big diesel engines are ready to do just that, right? So uh, in the early years, uh, building engineers would tell me, um, you know, I'd ask, well, how often do you test your, your backup generators? Oh, every week. And I say, okay, for how long? Uh, a half an hour every week. And then I say, at what load? And they say, what do you mean? It's too risky to transfer the actual load. I just turn it on. In other words, they run it at no load. Um, we had a disastrous experience with that in the data center industry. Uh, low load operation of a diesel engine is not good, not what they're designed for. Uh, and so I can get into lots of reasons why, um, but we've seen this firsthand where you know, they don't burn all the fuel, uh, the engine block doesn't heat up uniformly, uh, and so you um, uh, end up with, particularly in sailboats, not getting a lot of life, not getting a long life out of a diesel engine. Uh, much, much less than uh, applications like uh, uh, freight rail, uh, long haul trucking, et cetera. Uh, and then add to that the fact that uh, years ago uh, when diesels were uh, adopted for, uh, particularly for recreational marine, you didn't have much in the way of electronics. You had, you had your, your nav lights and things, uh, but you certainly didn't have uh, iPods or iPads and everything else. So, um, and, and you went to the ice place and got a big block of ice and that was your fridge. So today, uh, particularly in recreational boating, there people are looking for uh, creature comforts that are electrically powered. So we spin these little alternators and for years that worked reasonably well. Um, but uh, again, uh, particularly if you're a cruiser, and you drop anchor and you see that your batteries need to be replenished, you put that diesel engine in neutral, rev it up. Um, and in this case, let's, we'll use a 27 horsepower diesel, works out to about 20 kilowatts. Uh, so even if you have upgraded that diesel to a 200 amp alternator, well, it's only 12 volts. Let's call it 14 in terms of what it's actually operating at. Um, you're actually loading at around Three kilo, less than three kilowatts on a 20 kilowatt engine. Again, low load on a diesel engine, not a good thing. So electric propulsion solves that problem and doesn't introduce any others, right? No, <laughs> I wish I could say that. Um, but what electric does offer is uh, a, uh, a more streamlined way to organize energy generation, storage and use on a boat. Uh, and it also offers uh, more modularity. So if you do a conversion to electric, you can do it in stages. You can start with a small battery bank and increase it, or you can add a generator later. You don't have to bite, the whole, bite off the whole apple and swallow it at once. Uh, and for, um, for our customers, they find that the things they have to give up uh, in order to have electric are things they're okay giving up in order to get the benefits they see. Uh, frequently what we hear at boat shows when where we exhibit the equipment, um, a, um, uh, a married man will say, gee, I wish my wife would go out with me more on the boat. And I said, well, why doesn't she? Well, she doesn't like the noise and the smell of the diesel. Um, or at one boat show, we actually had a couple start arguing in front of us where he went on about, well, we need a new windlass and blah, 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 blah. And she said, well, I want that because I'm tired of the stink of that diesel. Uh, so, um, uh, one of the points that uh, you'll, you'll hear me make over and over here is it's not for everyone. Uh, if, if you use your boat in a way where you need, you, you, you're primarily concerned with going fast, you're, you're going, eat, and, and we have, we've met sailboat owners who use their sailboats more like power boats. Um, and so, you know, we're, and then at the other end of the spectrum, we have sailboat customers uh, who very judiciously use their system. 
Um, they don't have large battery banks, um, but um, one gentleman in particular, uh, he sails on and off his mooring. For him, it's more of a backup thing than anything else. So, um, uh, so to elaborate, uh, with electric, we can organize whether it's dockside power, onboard generator, we can mix and match these different things. Um, we've even seen fuel cells uh, exhibited at the boat show. They're still expensive, uh, but that's something we're keeping an eye on. Uh, and batteries, we'll talk more about batteries later. Uh, and together, we can support the various loads and things that we have. And that way, we can engage with customers about what do they have on the boat, uh, where are they going on the boat, what kind of situation will they be in, and we can mix and match the different components uh, to, to deliver what they want. So the end result is that we're doing what's already done on cruise ships, subs, and on the railroad. In other words, yes, there's a diesel engine, in fact, probably two big ones in that locomotive, but what's actually moving the wheels is an electric traction motor. So um, let's talk about, uh, well, I'm gonna stop and pause. Any questions so far? Okay, I'll keep going. What are the obstacles that we're seeing and what are we doing about them? Uh, I'm gonna talk about five. Education, scale, integration, perception, and language. Education. Uh, you know, we, um, we've all, uh, you know, grown up in a fossil fuel powered world with, with cars as our primary means of getting around. Um, and uh, the, that's what we're used to. And so it seems natural and normal that we have combustion engines on boats, whether they're for uh, you know, fishing boats or sailboats, whatever the case is. Um, so uh, the way we approach the situation when we get an inquiry, when somebody asks us, well, I'd like to learn more about electric, is we try to do just that. We try to teach them about electric. Um, also, uh, we try to spread the word through, through various things. Um, the image on the left, uh, that is a guild of uh, craftsmen, uh, mostly retirees, um, who work at a shop down in Solomons, Maryland, uh, where they have built uh, a replica uh, of a traditional Chesapeake crab scrape uh, that we did electric uh, for them. Uh, that's our demo boat with some uh, high school uh, STEM interns. We typically have two interns uh, in the fall um, and then another two for the summer. And then at the boat shows, uh, I spend a lot of time going over what I just took you through in terms of torque and I tell people about batteries and all of that. Uh, so uh, the only way to solve an education problem is to get out and teach people, right? Next challenge is scale. Um, what I mean by that is that internal combustion engines for boats are made in, in volumes larger than anybody is presently making electric, uh, although electric is starting to catch up. Uh, so we get people who ask, well, could I order a new boat from a, a builder with, a, um, with a electric in it? And um, more so in Europe, yes, uh, but they're, these folks are often very surprised to when they tell the boat builder, okay, I want that Fountain Peugeot catamaran. I want that Genoa monohull, you know, without the diesel that you normally would put in it. Um, and I'm gonna bring the boat here and I'm gonna have somebody, hopefully us, uh, do the electric here, uh, you know, near where I, I'm gonna sail the boat. Uh, and then they're surprised to hear, well, okay, your credit for not having the diesel put into that production boat is only you know, it's less than what they expect it to be. Well, the builders are, uh, and these are folks often who have in, had to install a new diesel in their boat, but you know, they don't get the same price that the builder gets. The builder gets a deep discount. Uh, and as yet in electric, we're not able to match those discounts. We just don't have the volume. So what's the solution? Well, we just have to grow. Um, and the key we think is to grow by finding the right people. Um, and making sure that the results are what they want. Uh, integration, well, thankfully, this is something we're not having to work too hard at because this is starting to happen in and of, of itself. Um, uh, mainly 
by virtue of CAN bus. Um, and NMEA 2000 is really a special application of, of CAN bus. Uh, that was developed by Bosch to get rid of all the wiring harnesses in cars. Um, and, uh, but it's readily adaptable to things like uh, controlling lithium batteries um, and uh, some of the propulsion manufacturers that we work with are beginning to use it for, for example, delivering uh, signals from the throttle to the motor controller. So, uh, and the result is, is very stable, it's plug and play, et cetera, et cetera. So, and then <clears throat> another of our manufacturers um, has gone further where to display information about the system, you don't need a proprietary screen. Uh, you just plug it into a Raymarine or a B, um, a B and G or whatever, uh, and it becomes a page on a Raymarine display. So that one is, is happening for us. Um, the next one, perception, is, is harder. Uh, and again, it has the same basic solution. We just have to get more of it out there um, and have more people go on forums and say, hey, this is, this is working. I'm very happy with it. Um, but um, people will tell us, well, you know, it's just really risky and dangerous, isn't it? And, um, uh, and in my data center world, I've done a fair amount of work in terms of reliability analyses and things like that. And what's striking about that, um, and I've been able to, had the good fortune to learn about that from MIT eggheads. What's interesting is, is that what we perceive as risky is skewed by our experience where the numbers will tell you a different story. So, um, you know, there are risks of having a diesel engine. We tend to discount those risks. Uh, and then uh, people think, oh, um, it's very risky to have an electric motor. I mean, what if my engine compartment fills with water? I said, what? If your engine compartment is filled with water, you have many, many more problems to deal with than the fact that your electric motor is underwater. You need to get off the boat, <laughs> et cetera. So again, these are things that we just have to work through. Um, and then the next challenge is language. Um, uh, what do we mean when, we, when a system is rated? Uh, one of the things that um, is confu confusing both in the marine world and in the data center world is a peak rating versus a continuous rating. Um, and so um, we'll talk more about things you, to be mindful of when, when you start to see boats with electric, but one thing to be mindful of is uh, you may see a label saying, well, this is a 10 kilowatt system. Well, that may be true for 30 seconds or two minutes, but continuous, it may only be eight kilowatts or something like that. Uh, we have always tried um, and generally succeeded to make every one of our customers understand that distinction. And if they tell us well, I'm, that they may, for example, be motoring all day down the waterway, um, that, okay, let's deliver a system that has a continuous rating sufficient to support that. Um, there's also language problems with batteries. Battery built manufacturers are great at coming up with language like deep cycle. What does that mean? Um, uh, it means that uh, the energy that's stored in the battery, how much in principle can you use? But it doesn't say anything about how fast can you use it. And that's very important for electric because a battery that is a great battery for house loads on a boat um, that may have be called upon to deliver five amps, six amps, seven amps, maybe 10. Um, a battery that's good at that, well, with propulsion, we're gonna be, we're gonna be hitting these batteries typically uh, 60, 70, 80 amps. Um, and a battery has to be able to perform. Uh, and we have to spend a lot of time with customers about, um, uh, you know, well, why can't I use a regular old battery like at West Marine? Well, that battery is happy at five, six, seven, eight amps or so, but at 60 amps, it's going to give you problems. It's going, the, it won't have the low internal resistance that we need to keep the voltage where we need so that the system operates efficiently. Um, we find that different people have different things in their heads when they talk about cruising and day sailing. Uh, and we've done boat shows all over the place. And we've come to learn that day sailing is almost a Chesapeake Bay thing. Uh, I 
described base sailing at the boat show in Seattle and people looked at me like, what planet are you from? Um, well, the day sailing on the Chesapeake is when a customer says, I need to motor for an hour, um, then I go sailing, then I need to motor back, and I'd like to have two hours extra of motoring in case I, you know, it's a real strong headwind or current or, or something like that. That's readily doable with one set of batteries uh, and charge at the dock. You do not need a generator for that in, say, a Catalina 30 or 27 or, you know, uh, 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 you know, battery uh, boats of that of that range, uh, and um, um, well, in Seattle, it's like nobody that that sail that that use pattern didn't seem to resonate. Well, nobody people said, well, you know, we either go out for you know a long or for a couple of days, or we don't go out at all, uh, and we have currents and and things to deal with here. Okay, so we've had to learn to have people tell us how they actually use the boat um, and uh, and also risk and reliability um, are things that uh, again people it's unfamiliar so it seems like it's riskier um, than than it really is so um, what's coming in the pipeline that's going to continue to give uh, uh, this that we think that we are betting <laughs> Uh, is going to increase the extent to which electric is uh, accepted in the in the marketplace. Well, um, we're going to talk about four things real quick, uh, and then we'll get to some more Q and A, and we have some more examples of some of the projects we've done, um, some things we can talk about there. Uh, so, energy storage is continuing to improve. I just read an article the other day that the next um, big set of improvements in lithium technology is about two years away. It's, it's in the labs now um, and being vetted for you know, production at scale. Um, and we've already seen uh, customers uh, expressing interest and um, going forward with lithium uh, batteries for propulsion. Uh, it, when we first started, uh, it was the, the cost difference was too great. Um, now, the cost difference between lithium and lead, on, uh, lead acid, even the, the better lead acid that has the higher um, uh, voltage stability at high uh, discharge rates, is such that anybody who's going to own the boat for a long time and use it a lot, um, total cost of ownership, life cycle cost, however you want to describe it, you're now better with lithium because you're going to get a lifespan out of a set of lithium batteries that's equal to about four uh, of even the good uh, lead acid batteries. Uh, next thing that's improving uh, is regeneration for sailboats. Um, and Sally and I will freely admit that in this industry, um, regeneration under sail was oversold. Uh, and we made it a point uh, to be, even if it cost us a sail, uh, to be clear with people about what they can and can't expect out of uh, regeneration under sail. Uh, it's always the case that um, unless you're sailing at you know, five, six knots in a 30-some you know, foot boat, you're not going to see it. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that, as you know, uh, with a displacement hold boat, the velocity of that water at the prop is higher than the boats moving through the, the velocity at which the boats moving through the water. Otherwise, the boat wouldn't move through the water, right? So that prop is set up for that velocity, not the boat's velocity. So under sail, well, now the, the water velocity at the prop is the sailing speed. And so where it was, that prop was matched for propulsion, now it's not matched for regeneration. So we've long dreamed about, well, what if we had a prop that could automatically adapt? Well, OceanVolt did it. Uh, OceanVolt is a, one of the companies we work with from Finland, uh, and they have developed, they call it the servo prop, um, and those blades will adjust the pitch. So in, in, a, in regeneration mode, their computer is watching what's going on and adjusting those blades to get the most out of that 
uh, motor, that, that unit in regeneration mode. So you don't have to drag a separate hydro generator if you're you know, planning a long trip. Um, what that's going to make possible is if you want to live off grid for weeks at a time in say a 40, 42, 44 foot catamaran with uh, down in the islands where the winds are good, you can do it with just that and some solar panels and maybe a wind generator um, and not give up a lot of creature comforts and thereby not need a generator and that's going to be huge. Uh, also, as I mentioned earlier, um, being able to plug and play and have information about the system uh, displayed at your, uh, at your nav station without having to have a, a dedicated display. Uh, and so, um, so with that, um, you, each year somebody else comes out with something new that moves the ball a little further forward uh, so that the range of, um, of boats and boating styles that we can support with electric gets a little bigger and a little bigger and a little bigger. Uh, and it um, also, uh, it's also the case that, you know, Morton Ray, he started that company literally out of his garage with uh, maybe a bank loan. Um, but, um, you know, he, he basically bootstrapped his company. Then some of the other companies that have come and gone were also basically undercapitalized. Uh, but with OceanVolt, uh, their founder was, uh, he, he was a technology guy. He started three different internet companies and sold them all to AT&T and took some of the proceeds uh, and also, you know, raised funds from other investors. Uh, also, um, this past October, uh, Sally and I had a chance to go out on an electric-powered crew, like a row a coach boat for rowers, right? Um, and we tooled around in the harbor in Annapolis at what, 18 knots or so? I mean, at one point, and yeah. so I, I finally said, I said I'm slow down. right, because we were getting dirty looks. Over. <laughs> um, and that is uh, an electric outboard by a company called Pure Watercraft. Uh, they're out on the Pacific West Coast. Um, Jeff Bezos is one of their backers. So, uh, so we, we were going, we've gone from poor Morton Ray in his garage with a bank loan uh, to you know, big, big money pouring into electric. So that means the products are going to be more refined um, and undergone more thorough testing. So what does all this mean for you as surveyors? Well, it's pretty much a foregone conclusion that you will be seeing electric powered boats. And um, I wanna just cover a couple of things that, um, that I think are really important. Um, modularity matters a lot um, and, and context matters. What I mean by that is you may have a situation where your customer who's looking to buy a boat plans to cruise um, and the boat is the seller is primarily a day sailor, okay? So, um, uh, and the particular propulsion system that's in the boat, the batteries that are in the boat, the charger that's in the boat may work very well for day sailing, but are not gonna do the job for cruising. Um, what I'm asking you to do is be aware of that so that you can tell your customer, this, this system was installed well, it meets this stand, you know, it, it meets ABYC E11, it meets TE30, but for what you tell me you plan to do with the boat, it's going to need some additional components. Now, the day after, you may go look at a boat where the customer did his own installation. Uh, one of the products we carry is, um, is driven by a DC motor, um, and which is very compact and it has the neodymium alloy magnets. So it's really compact, extremely powerful. And as a result, you can carry it on board the boat in a canvas bag. It's only 40 pounds, um, but it can replace a 27 horsepower diesel. Uh, and so because you don't need a crane to install it, you can install it yourself. And uh, many of our customers, you know, they're adventurous, hands-on people anyway. They may not have read every line of E11 or TE30. They may get a few things wrong, um, but they largely get a decent installation done themselves. 
And then we have some others that should definitely have had a yard or somebody, a professional, do their installation for them. So you, you'll see both ends of the spectrum and in the middle as well. Um, you, you'll see total rat's nests out there. Uh, and then you'll see some, some uh, installations that you're going to be surprised by. That, that, uh, you know, that this is a person is an accountant or is um, uh, a doctor or whatever, but is in his spare time. Uh, uh, is uh, very hands-on and, and did research online and YouTube videos and read up articles and things and, and put, put a good system together. So you, you'll see it all over the place, but I ask you to keep in mind the distinction between a, a crappy installation job that needs to be dealt with and straightened out versus an application issue where the application is good for this boater not good for that boater. So that's a situation that uh, I, I think you'll, you'll be seeing that separate from what was the installation done correctly or not. Um, you will see a variety of different approaches. Uh, we specifically, um, you know, we started with one manufacturer because that particular manufacturer is a European company that was looking for new U US representation. Um, and that was a good way to get started, but we quickly realized that their product was great for some people and great for some boats, not so great for others. Um, but once we got started, other manufacturers reached out, found us and said, well, what do you think of our product? And it became clear that if we could start working with a wider variety of manufacturers, then we can tell our customers, look, we're not here to push one product. We're here to understand you, your boat, and what you want out of the project. And then let's mix and match and figure out what's gonna deliver that for you uh, at a price that you can afford um, and that uh, in, in a way that will work with you in terms of um, how, uh, you know, how you sail, where you go, and all of that. So um, I, I'd ask that you not write off you know, one system versus another they all have their ups and downs. So um, the DC motor product, for example, um, that motor uh, is um, used in uh, dirt bikes uh, and um, uh, in factory automation in very harsh environments. So it can tolerate uh, being uh, in a marine environment. Uh, you do have a brush change with it, but it's a high quality alloy brush, so it lasts, it lasts uh, 2,000 hours or so. Um, but because it's compact and powerful, older classic boats with very small engine compartments, it, it's, it's the only one that'll fit. Uh, and so, um, uh, and then it, it does, it is air cool. So yes, in your survey reports, you could ding I could understand you dinging a, an installation of a DC motor like that where there was no additional cooling provided, no ventilation installed. Yeah, that's an issue. Um, but I would ask you not to ding it for just being a DC motor with brushes. Uh, and um, one of the other manufacturers we have is uh, where they do uh, an induction motor that's totally sealed. It's IP67. Um, it, it, it can tolerate uh, all kinds of spray and, and all of that. And it's, it's liquid cooled, uh, but it's three times the size and three times the weight. Now in some boats, that's not an issue, uh, but particularly in these older classic yachts, uh, you know, the one that fits is the one that fits. And um, uh, what I would ask you to judge an installation on is, hey, did somebody think through this, this system? Why this one or why this approach? And does it seem to fit the situation at hand? Um, another thing uh, I wanna make sure you're, you're clear on is that even if it's an older system, even if it's a manufacturer that's no longer around, um, a lot of the different manufacturers use common components that are still being made. Uh, and so um, we, um, uh, the company that we started working with when we started the company uh, from Denmark, uh, we have been contacted and reached out to people who bought that system from the previous distributor. Uh, and they have, uh, in some cases, called or wrote 
uh, emails to us saying, oh, my system looks like it's died um, and here's what it's doing or I'm having some problems with it. Um, and some of these are 10, 11 years old. Well, last year we fixed two of them um, and just by refreshing components. So, um, uh, it, it, so a, you may see a system that looks old, but it doesn't necessarily mean, well, it's a write-off that we have to scrap it and, and get rid of it. So, um, so that's the end of the, the presentation part, uh, et cetera. Um, just to recap, we, electric is viable today. It may not be for every boat. It may not be for every boater. Um, but the people who want the quiet, uh, who, who want the reduced maintenance, uh, and um, uh, they want better control. You have very precise control of what the boat's actually doing with electric. And uh, motor sailing, much easier to control with electric. So for the people who want that, uh, it's available to them and it works. Uh, I do have, um, and here's contact info for us, our website, annapolishybridgreen.com. We'll post this in a PDF form. Uh, this is uh, the Danish Thusa system with the DC motor. That's what it looks like installed. That's uh, Irwin 30 that was done right up here, up the road here in Baltimore. Uh, there's the, uh, you saw them in the previous image, you saw the model. That's the Chesapeake scrape uh, under construction there uh, in Solomons. Boat's name is Carol Jean, and they put an outlet in the, in the O of Carol. <laughs> Uh, and um, that's uh, Bill and, and Carol Jean. Uh, Bill is a retired admiral. Uh, he was with the Navy, what, 30 some odd years? Um, and, um, uh, and that's at Solomon's, the Patuxent River. Uh, this is a Leopard 38. Uh, this is a liverboard couple, they snowbird. Uh, so they are gonna be passing through our area probably in a couple of weeks or so, headed up to uh, New England, sometimes they go all the way to Maine. Um, sometimes they just hang out at Cape Cod and then in the winter they're either in the Keys or they sometimes go to the Bahamas. Uh, they had two Yanmar 27s. We did two of the Danish DC motors at nine kilowatts and supplied a diesel powered DC generator at 48 volts, 14 kilowatts. Um, and um, we had about a three year conversation on and off with them before they decided to go forward. But as they, that last year before they decided to do it, um, they kept detail, detailed records of their fuel consumption. Uh, and then they kept a detailed record of their fuel consumption after we did their conversion. They purchase a quarter of the diesel fuel that they used to purchase without any change of the trip patterns that, that they take. The reason for that is our approach eliminates running the diesel at low load, like I described earlier, just to spin an alternator, an auxiliary alternator, um, you know, for a couple, you know, for, for um, 150, 160 amps or so at, at 12 volts. So in this setup, uh, the, uh, the diesel DC generator automatically starts when it senses the batteries are low. Um, and we, they did not go lithium. Um, they may in the future, uh, but we supplied what we call TPPL, thin plate pure lead. Uh, that's a battery that has a larger number of thinner plates in the same enclosure. So at 60, 80, 90 amps, uh, it's got very low internal resistance, almost as good as lithium. So you don't have voltage degradation that's going to affect the performance of the motor. And the other benefit is when that generator is spitting out, um, you know, 150, 100, uh, 170, uh, well, it's even a little more uh, amps, those batteries are able to accept it. So they come back up to charge very quickly. And so that diesel spends 80% or more, except for startup and cool down. So 80 to 85% of its operating life at about 80 to 85% load. That's a diesel engine that's operated like a diesel engine is designed to do. That's a diesel engine that's going to last. Um, and so they ha they've virtually eliminated low load operation of the diesel. That's where the fuel savings comes from. That's one of our, uh, our interns. Um, and I, I crammed him, him in there so he could help me take measurements when we were sea trialing. So there's the, the 14 kilowatt 
uh, diesel DC generator. Uh, if you recognize that color, that's a Volvo Penta diesel. Uh, in that case, it's a D130, but where the transmission would normally go, it's all in black, so it's hard to see, is a gigantic alternator driven off the main shaft. And then its output goes up to those panels there, uh, which is the diode bridge. So it gets rectified to 48 volts there. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, this is a, a product uh, that uh, a couple in uh, Seattle developed. Uh, he is a product development guy. I mean, he's worked in the cosmetics industry and the dental equipment industry actually on, you know, if, if your, you know, skincare thing has a real sleek look to it, well, he did that. Um, this is a ultra lightweight electric outboard um, where the target market for it is older cruising couples uh, for whom, you know, winching a, a big outboard for their dinghy has become a problem. It only weighs 21 pounds. Um, and uh, what's interesting about it is it, many things, but one in particular is that it will push a nine to 10 foot dinghy, two people, two bags of groceries uh, at about 3.7, 3.8 knots in calm water. Um, and, but the interesting part is how people perceive it. They always want to know, well, what's the horsepower? What's the horsepower? Well, that's what they're used to. I understand that. Um, but for a dinghy, uh, people will say, well, I got to have a five horsepower engine on my dinghy. If you actually look at the numbers and compare with what, with what this is able to produce, this doesn't even produce one horsepower. But as you know, right, speed and power is not proportional. It's not linear. It's exponential. So when you rev up, uh, say, a four horsepower or five horsepower uh, gas outboard in a dinghy, yeah, you may get uh, up to maybe 4.8, 4.9 or whatever, but the last knot was delivered by the last probably three horsepower. In other words, uh, most of that extra power um, is, is getting you a little bit more speed at the high end, but really not that much. So people are surprised, um, and, and they were at the Annapolis Boat Show this past year, and they were tooling around in, you know, showing it off, and, and people couldn't believe something this small um, could deliver what it delivers, but it does. Uh, <clears throat> this is Ocean Bolt. Um, the, uh, they uh, have come out with a new uh, shaft drive that's competing with some of the other players out there. This is the company from Finland. Uh, this is uh, an example of how they do refits. Uh, they designed that sail drive leg basically to mimic a Volvo Penta or Yanmar. Uh, and if you tell them you're replacing a Yanmar, they'll send this plate with the holes uh, to match the plate that the MR provides. So every, anything to do, they can do to make the installation easier, they've pretty well thought of. Yes, sir? On the shoes, you know, um, when you showed this the first time, it said something about a regeneration system. Does that turn into an alternator when it's not under load? Uh, yes, all of the ocean bolts have regeneration capability, and in effect, it is an alternator, yes. It's just that that servo prop that they've now come up with really <laughs> ups the performance that uh, that is capable of delivering. Uh, this is a Dutch manufacturer, Netherlands, uh, Belmarine, uh, who has, uh, this is the larger water-cooled unit. Um, this we're, uh, we're offering at the power catamaran market and the low speed, you know, not planing type uh, power vessel like trawlers, for example. Uh, particularly those headed for warm climates, it's liquid cooled. Uh, and um, the liquid cooling can be done with a heat exchanger with, and with coolant in the primary loop. And here, uh, and plus they can gang together to get really high outputs. Uh, this is uh, where they've married two of them together, 240s to get 80 kilowatts. Um, and um, I know this, uh, going back to the torque difference that I was describing earlier, you can generally, with electric, multiply the continuous KW by about three, and that will give you the diesel horsepower that you can replace. 
I know people argue with us all the time about this. Well, there's, there's only 746 watts in a horsepower. How can that possibly be? It's the torque difference. Um, and so this motor is actually installed in one of these canal tour boats. That yes, it's got long water line length, relatively narrow beam, uh, but um, that motor and a set of lithium batteries, uh, these types of craft in the Netherlands and in Denmark um, and in some other places, uh, they'll go all day, eight in the morning to eight at night, taking tourists around the canals without a generator. They just plug in and charge overnight. We also run 365 days a year. Worth, worth doing if you get over there, it's a lot of fun. Uh, we also offer the electric yacht system. Uh, this is designed by a sailor, he lives up in Minnesota, uh, and he is a patented inventor uh, in motor controls. So he has patents in some of the technology. He's a contributor to some of the technology advances that we're able to use with electric. Um, this doesn't have the nice finish per se, uh, but his, um, his intention was to offer a lower cost, but still rugged, so it may not look as sexy as the European models, uh, but lots of customers out there have them um, and are satisfied with them. So, um, uh, and, um, and they, you know, they're, they're not as aesthetically minded. Yes, it's a golf cart type throttle, um, but it's, it's rugged, you know, it's a rugged throttle and, and no one has, has called us and said, you know, my throttle broke. Uh, and so, you know, he's using a lot of tried and true stuff. And that's what they look like installed. Um, it may look like, a, not the cleanest installation, uh, but, um, uh, but they're out there, um, and, um, and people are making long trips with good reliability out of them. Then another interesting thing um, that, pardon the pun, we don't have a lot of traction on yet. Uh, this is a, basically an insert. It, uh, it's a piece of equipment that would go between the drive shaft output of a big diesel and the transmission. Uh, if you can push that transmission back 16 inches and slip this in, uh, it's an automatic clutch type system where you can now drive the boat with electric at lower speeds um, or disengage the electric motor for high op speed operation with diesel. In that mode, the motor becomes a generator and recharges batteries um, and also has a boost mode where let's say you have a medical emergency or something, you've got to get back quickly. Um, you can override the generator control and tell it to the motor and the diesel to give it all you've got. So your batteries will deplete, uh, but you'll get maybe another knot, knot and a half, uh, and that may, uh, may help. Uh, this is costly, um, but for some applications where, uh, uh, where fuel consumption is a concern, this would again deliver that same benefit of limiting low speed, low load operation of big diesel. Uh, so let's say you're a fishing boat and you're operating in, uh, in a wake zone, but why crank up a six, 600 or 500 horsepower diesel just to, to go, you know, five knots in a wake zone, the electric can take care of that. Um, and that way you can end up saving a good amount of fuel. So that's it for pretty much for the show and tell, and I would uh, be happy to hear any further questions. David, go back to the uh, slide where it gives all the information about the website and everything. Uh, yes. If people want to copy that down well. Right there. Yeah. I, um, I applaud you both for what you're doing in this area. It's just really interesting. Um, so I'm based in the UK. Um, this is not a question, it's more a comment about perception. So of course, electric cars are now becoming all the rage. Sure, they are in America, they are in the UK. Would I drive an electric car? Absolutely not. But ask me why, and I can't really tell you why, because it's about perception. And I think that's the biggest challenge at the moment. Just a thought. Uh, no disagreement. And um, uh, I, I can't say that we've converted everyone, um, but when that's why we spent the money on the demo boat. Uh, People are amazed at, at what that little motor can do. Yeah. 
uh, and that's you know when you can touch it and feel it that um, it was funny when when we first did the conversion on it and we launched it um, you know the uh, public marina not too far from where we live uh, I just gave it a shove got in um, drifted away from the dock a little bit opened it up and the boat almost took off and left me in the water um, because it the torque app is just amazing and when people feel that uh, then they they start to get how how just how powerful you know electric can be yes sir yes we're finding that if they're installed properly and cared for reasonably well they don't need huge amounts of maintenance but um, uh, even the DC motor you know I we've uh, the the, the um, uh, the one from Denmark, uh, we have customers, um, or we, we're in touch with customers who bought from the previous distributor uh, who are still using them, you know, 10 and 12 years, you know, after they, after they bought them, and they've only done one brush change or whatever. Uh, so if they're installed well and applied well, they'll hold up. How about the price of the uh, catamaran? What did it cost? Um, yeah, rough numbers. Can, it's about a thousand dollars a continuous KW, um, and the generators are in the teens. The DC generators, we get those from a, a, a company in California called Polar Power, whose primary business is forty-eight volt telecom backup. Uh, uh, but their technology. Um, uh, so there's an example of how we're we're using a manufacturer that's got scale in another industry to give us something in marine. There, that 14 kilowatt unit is what, 17K, something like that, Sally? Around 18. 18, so 18, nine and nine, so 218, you know, all, all in they spent, you know, about 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 40K on the, on the conversion. Um, and he's one who did 90% of the installation himself. Um, and did a bang up job, did a darn good job, and I helped him for part of it. Uh, but um, uh, and, um, uh, and they're still they're still going up and down. Sir, are you familiar with the Hall Company up in uh, Lake George? The they bought the bought the Elko boat rights. Oh, okay. I was wondering about yeah, we've been talking about longevity. Yeah. That 1898 launch you have a picture of, it may not be that one. They've got one up there that they were restoring. From that original, time period? It's got the original drive in it. No. The original rheostat, the old exposed rheostat. It's all there and it works. No. Oh, that would be so cool all to see that. In uh, Lake George. In Lake yeah. George. Oh, that would be, wow. Yeah. The, the ingenuity, you know, what they had to work with, you know, it's almost too easy today. I mean, we buy these bricks and wire them up and program them and they work. What's the uh, battery banks on these things? Well, um, nearly everything we sell is 48 volt. Uh, the Bell Marines, the bigger Bell Marines are either, uh, the, the biggest ones are 144. So it's, um, you know, four 12 volt batteries or, you know, 12. 12 volt batteries for the 144s. Um, we uh, try to steer customers away from your basic West Marine battery that's good for, for house loads, but explaining this idea of voltage degradation, uh, I try to, uh, well, I'll explain it like, like this. Um, you know, when you, when you go to a sporting event and the traffic's bad, you know, because a lot of people are trying to get to the, the venue at the same time. Uh, it's like, it's like more ramps on an expressway. Um, the thin plate pure lead batteries I described earlier, it's like having more ramps on ramps, off ramps, electrons can get out of the battery and come in easier. Um, and so that's what we encourage people to use and not just a regular old, what we call as a 20 hour battery. Um, but for the smaller craft, um, you know, uh, Catalina 22, something like that. Yeah, the, the, those batteries will be okay. Um, or if you're on a budget, the Trojan uh, golf cart batteries, they're a pretty good choice at the, you know, the, the budget end. 
Uh, you have more connections, it's a six volt battery, but that's not the end of the world. Um, I rambled a little bit there, did I answer your question? Well, yeah, I mean, what's, I mean, normal batteries, three to five years life, what's those? those about that, about yeah, that yeah, depending upon how they're used. And, and the other question, I, as a surveyor, when you survey these, what do we look for? I mean, what anomalies or what things go wrong that a surveyor, besides the battery corrosion, mm. besides the battery being covered and secured, and all the basic ABYC stuff, <clears throat> what other things would... Um, heat. Yeah, first on the list would be heat and cooling. Uh, th that's, it's, it, it's a, a cat that can be skinned a couple of different ways, um, but it, it, you got to do something about it, either a fan or a liquid cooling. So is blowers always running in the engine room? Well, um, they, they can be tied in. In other words, they can be interconnected with the system so that only when you're using the system does the blower come on so you don't, you know. Um, and just to give you an idea, um, the, the Danish Thus of the DC motor uh, and the electric yacht uh, at, let's say you have a, a 10 kilowatt system uh, and um, uh, with the DC motor, the, the neodymium alloy magnet motor is very efficient. Uh, so we can get, you know, 92, 93% efficiency out of it. But at 10 kilowatts, that's 700 watts. That's a small hair dryer. Um, and it's an amount of heat that you've got to, you know, if, if the compartment is enclosed, it's going to accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. So, yeah. So, um, you know, West Marine has the either two inch or three or three or four inch you know, barrel type fans, one of those is usually sufficient. Um, then alignment, shaft alignment is one thing um, that uh, uh, DIY installers might struggle with. Also mounting. And mounting. Um, one issue that comes up from time to time is we'll see electric systems mounted on the same kind of motor mounts that you would put, you would mount a, a diesel on. Well, those are, those are tuned like a tuning fork for the vibrations that are going to be imparted on them by explosions in a hunk of metal um, and in a, in, a, in a heavy hunk of metal, right? So as that spring compresses, if that mount is matched to the engine, then it's going to absorb the vibrations and be solid. But um, a light electric motor is not going to compress that mount very much. And we've seen some cases where they wobble a little bit and that shouldn't be. Uh, so we actually prefer to hard mount them. Uh, we use fine threaded rods sometimes. Uh, so you can have nice adjustment uh, when you're aligning it. Uh, and maybe you put a little rubber pad or whatever, uh, but you don't have the kind of vibration problems to deal with. So. I would say if you if it was me surveying um, and it was an operable system, I would run it and I would at the dock and I'd look for you know is it wobbling, and then try to understand why. Um, then uh, another thing is, um, and this one this one would be hard if you can't actually take the boat out, and that is, did the whoever provided the system did that person or the installer um, get some calculations done in order to properly match the gearing, right? So your typical um, Yamar Volvo Penta engine, there'll be a two to one or something along those lines reduction in the transmission, right? Um, and so we, we work with every customer to try to make sure that um, we understand their prop uh, and to the extent props can be understood, we've come to think of them as a bit of a black art, right? But um, the, uh, the Danish system, that lower gear is changeable, right? This motor, we like to have it max out at around 3,200 RPM. Um, so if the prop calcs show something like, um, you know, we don't want to spin that prop further than, you know, 11 or, you know, something, then we look for a three to one reduction. So, so that when, when the motor is maxed out at max throttle, that prop is 
spinning at its optimal point, you know, well before any cavitation is going to happen or whatever. Um, and so, um, so if you get the gearing wrong, either you'll, um, you'll have too much reduction and you'll not get much speed. Um, yeah, and the motor will be happy because the motor's not working very hard, right? Uh, when you when when you don't spin the prop up to get a real load going, the motor's not going to work very hard. So in that, you know, nothing bad is going to happen necessarily in that scenario. But you've spent money on capacity you're not using, um, and you're not going to get decent speed out of the boat. Or in the other direction, now you're overloading the motor. So. Now, do you, when the person buys it off of you or whatever, do you design it to match the props and everything? As best we can. Okay. Some people tell us, my boat's in the water, I want to do the conversion, and I don't know what prop I have. Well, for them, we send the big gear. And we say, let's, let's well, that can be changed in about 20 minutes. It's not that hard to do. So we tell them, uh, if you don't want to haul the boat and, and look at the prop, then we'll err on the high side of uh, the safe side. Then you'll, we'll either come out with you and see trial it or we send you a form and fill out these measurements. If we know that, okay, their boat has a, uh, a hull speed of 6.3 and the system, you know, at full throttle are only getting 4.2, well, we know the system can do better than that. Um, and so, but until we have that measurement, we don't know how much better. Right, but when we have that measurement, then we can make a calculation and get pretty darn close in terms of how to, which size smaller gear is gonna be the right one. Uh, now, the Bell Marines and the others um, uh, that are of that design, of direct drive design, there you get XRPM and you have to match the prop. Right, so, so, um, uh, so again, this idea of some systems are more easily adapted than others. You know, the Belmarine has a lot going for it um, in terms of its ruggedness and all of that, but you're stuck with their RPM. So for them, but then we have customers that say, well, you know, my prop is in bad shape. I'm going to replace it anyway. What should I replace it with? So it's, it's case by case, but, um, uh, and that may be difficult from a surveying standpoint. How do you know? Um, what record, you know, is there on the boat of what gearing is there? But if you can take it out and sea trial it um, and see that you're getting reasonably, reasonably good speed um, and the motor's not burning up uh, uh, or the motor is, you know, comfortably within capacity, it may be, you know, close to full capacity, but if it's only 10% below, that's not the end of the world. But if you see that situation, then you can be pretty comfortable that somebody went through an effort to match that prop and so that the gearing on that system. What are some other? Um... I know we've had people ask about rust. Um, rust is going to happen. It happens on diesel engines. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, there are not... things that you can do with these motors to protect them from rust, just like you can do with a diesel engine. And we tell our customers that, you know, go in there, check it. If you see some rust, Get out your uh, your little you know fine wire scrubby and get it off and then then put some sort of rust protect protectant on there. But we've had older systems come to us that have, have been you know fairly rusted, but that motor still runs. You know, it's, as long as the rust does not get into the windings, right. it it'll just keep chugging along. Mm -hmm. We've had oh, those motors have been submerged and will still run. We don't recommend it, but they'll survive. Yes, sir. Other than, other than the required overload protection, are those motors thermally protected internally against heat? Uh, some are, some aren't. Um, uh, and um, that's, that's a good point because our, our Scandinavian friends, well, Finland isn't part of Scandinavia, but our Northern European friends, uh, we constantly have to remind them of how important that is. Uh, one of their, their engineers said to me, well, well, you know, th the water's cold, so the hull of the boat's going to be cold. Doesn't that help? Not in the Gulf of Mexico where the water temperature can get to 96 or so. Um, uh, and so um, uh, uh, 
we're heading into a situation though where that's going to be standard you know and you'll the bow marine uh you actually see the temperature reading on the screen um and they'll go into you know they'll go into a a, a, a power limit mode you know uh, if if the temperature and ocean vault has that as well yes sir and you're getting reversed by changing the input uh, no, the motor controllers handle that. Uh, and um, uh, so for a DC motor, you just swap the leads and it'll go in the opposite direction. Um, for a three phase AC motor, swap any two. Uh, but the, but um, the controllers are so sophisticated these days that um, they, you, know, you have a, a signal pin, you know, close this contact to go in reverse, close this contact to go forward, and it manages the sequence of what's, what it's doing in terms of what it's sending to the motor accordingly. So that's easy. Well, I've got another one for you in terms of things to watch out for. Um, it's common uh, and, and desirable because it's cheap and easy to do to use DC-DC converters. So you can get... Um, and they're, they're cheap and reliable these days, 48 to 12 volt. Um, so many of our customers are, might, might be racing sailors or they want low weight. They're, they're, and they're attracted to electric for low weight. Um, and okay, they incur weight to have propulsion batteries. Well, what about house batteries? Well, we tell them you should still have one just in case you have a problem, but you don't need these huge house batteries that you typically would, would carry around. And the DC, DC converter will let the propulsion bank kind of backstop the 12 volt. Must be an isolated DC converter, right? Where, and you can tell a non-isolated where you put an ohmmeter on the two negatives, the 48 volt negative and 12 volt negative. If you get any kind of con continuity, that's not an isolated conver uh, converter. That will cause problems, um, a variety of problems, including, it, the, the controllers, it disturbs the controllers in some way that I don't fully understand, but um, uh, it, it introduces a signal reference issue, I think is what it really turns out to be. Um, and so you always want to make sure that that's an isolated converter. And it'll, it'll say so on the nameplate. Um, battery voltages. The bigger, the bigger the voltage, the more you have to do to make it safe. So. 48 is what ABYC says is you know, work on that. If we are going up to 72, we've got a system that's 72, 96, 144. What we do is we do a disconnect in between and break it into sections. So we let the, the, uh, the owner know, okay, this is, this is how it's going to be wired. You have to go in and work on it. The disconnect goes on, so we break it into smaller voltages working on so that yes thanks i forgot about that one so yeah. that that should always be provided and these are all ignition protected you know there should be no fuel on the boat you know there's always that person well the, the thusa is not it's not the thusa is not the bellmarine is the the uh the, the sail drive is the, the bellmarine is the um and then from that, from that standpoint, yes, um, you can actually see, you know, or if you the could actually, you can actually, if brushes against the rotor, you'll see little sparks happening there. Um, I personally, now I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not going to stand here and argue with hundreds of people who work together to develop a standard. I'm not going to do that. But I can just tell you personally, from what I understand is that for this motor to blow up a boat, you have to have a concentration of flammable gas in an enclosed area such that anything, you know, you, anything is, it will set it off, you know, a, a relay in an air conditioner or, or something. Um, you know, in other words, if you have a, a high enough concentration, that boat's going to blow up. Right. Something's going to blow it up. But I understand the concern. Uh, and then um, the electric yacht, and the Ocean Volt AX, not the AXC, uh, those are open frame motors, but they are AC motors, no brushes. Um, but I don't know whether that specifically counts as ignition protected or not. 
Um, I have to, I, I don't have that at my fingertips, but it is, um, you know, th there's a project um, that's just finishing up uh, another one up here in Baltimore where, you know, they um, decided uh, to, um, you know, build some extra partitioning in, you know, to keep the propane separate or, or something, they did some, some things to, for that reason. Uh, but that might be a, um, a reason to look at, say, Belmarine, for example. Um, and Belmarine, you know, I showed you pictures of the larger Belmarines, but they go, their smallest um, in shaft drive is five, you know, five kilowatts. But definitely that's something to look at if you're surveying and you open up the engine compartment and they've got a propane water heater in the engine compartment. Right. The or contiguous with it in some way. Propulsion yeah. system. Yeah. Um, and no protection between that. We assume when we talk to people, and I ask them a lot because I get the first round of questions, but we assume this is an engine compartment. You're not going to have propane or gas or, you know, anything in this engine compartment. And your propane is going to be in a locker that's vented overboard. So when people start asking me questions, I say, well, where's your propane? You know, you have propane on board. Where do you keep your tanks? Okay, fine. It's on the deck, vented overboard. You're okay. So, you know, if you open up an engine compartment and see strange things, then whoever put that electric motor in did not do it the way they were supposed to. It's probably a DIY or what you like to call it tinker tissues. Thank you. So, thank you for having us. Um, I have to, Thank you. I have some business cards here. Your, uh, uh, more than welcome to reach out to us with any questions you have uh, or if you're